My name Chinar Bosisian. <laughs> My title: I'm um, a co-founder and the CEO here at Feedback Intelligence. We call it Feedback Intelligence, and how I take my coffee, I just take it. <laughs> However, they they give it to me. <laughs> Welcome to the MLOps Community Podcast. What is going on, everyone? I'm your host Dimitri Os, and today talking with Chinar, we had a conversation about metrics and evaluating your AI products, not evaluation metrics. She brought a whole new approach and idea that I had not heard before and really looking at AI products, just like we look at other products and figuring out what are the ways that we can know if our AI products are successful, but not thinking about it from the lens of an engineer needs to be the one that is figuring out if the product is successful. There are so many other stakeholders in the loop. We need to be thinking about how they are able to look at metrics around product usage, specifically the PM. How does a product manager know if a product is well-received or not? If these AI products, and this comes back to something that I have been thinking about frequently when it comes to the democratization of AI. What we've been doing with AI is allowing everyone to leverage its power, except for the most part, the majority of the tools are built for engineers. We aren't building as much tooling for the non-technical stakeholders who are also in the room as these AI products are being shipped. Chinar talks a lot about how we can think about the other people that are in the room and encourage them to be there. I love this metaphor that she used or analogy that she used, which was where is the mix panel or amplitude for AI product usage? We have not seen that yet. I'm excited for the idea Would love to hear what you all think. So drop in a comment. Let me know if this resonates with you. And as always, if you liked it, and especially on this one, if you know a product manager that would like this kind of stuff, send it on over to him. I think product managers everywhere are thinking deeply about this and wondering how the hell they're supposed to do it with these AI products. But That's my assumption, and I'd love to get a little validation on it. Let's jump into the conversation with Chinar. I'm managing to stay hydrated on a hot day in Germany, which is like one out of three that we have per year. So I know you're in San Francisco still, and uh, you have to deal with the heat a little bit more often. But... I want to talk about all the different cool stuff that you have done up until now. So tell me more about this object detection model, putting them onto drones in the agriculture industry, Raspberry Pi deployment. You're going from computer vision models. I imagine they were very big. You had to make them small so that they worked on a drone. Give me more context because that sounds like an awesome problem to be solving. Yeah. Yeah, that that was very fun. So, and it was my first project, to be honest, like for deep learning. I did some projects before that, but that was something that I was, oh, this is going to be not a research project, but something that is going to be in production. So I should be careful. We should be careful. (laughs) And I remember that was like YOLO 3. Like that was that time. The good old days. Yeah, we were excited about that. And in terms of draws, like solving the problem for object detection, it's all about high resolution images. So uh, very like tiny objects, like you you have to like for crop crop analysis or a lot of this, this stuff or spraying, like automatically uh, spray the, the field. So this was the project and we're, we had a lot of data, like more than more than 10k high resolution images and we 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 
were required to annotate it and we had a lot of people there to manually go over it and then train it, like annotate the data and then fine tune that YOLO3, adapt it to that use, use case like custom training and then get some models, some checkpoints. And of course, it's not going to be to be good enough on on Raspberry Pi because of Jaws, like you cannot have GPUs on on Jaws, unfortunately. And the idea was just translate it to a um, lighter model and deploy it, and then and then see what's happening. Even though after doing this, we got a lot of like bugs. We had we had a lot of like false positives, false negatives because of illumination, lighting, this all stuff. Uh, different things were happening, but yeah. I'm still waiting for the company that straps a GPU to a drone. <laughs> Maybe NVIDIA. Yeah, that's the next billion dollar company, huh? That is, who wants to go and raise some money for that one? That is hilarious yeah. to think about. But the the interesting piece there, I think, is you were doing this with Yellow 3, as you mentioned. It was deep learning before deep learning was cool. Right. Most people, I imagine were excited to work on deep learning back in those days because everybody learns about it. It's the cutting edge techniques. Mm -hmm. And I can only echo what I've heard from the community and all these conversations and how everybody wanted to work on deep learning until they got into the enterprise. And then it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> like there's not really deep learning happening here. I exactly. have to go and do that. You didn't have that case. And you went out and also did other cool stuff with drones, right? Like that wasn't your first foray into it. Later, you were doing surveillance stuff and working with yellow models. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a surveillance use case for um, person and car detection for street surveillance purposes. And it was a small project, like a small um, like startup, we can say. At that time, I was in Armenia based in Armenia and we were doing that for like uh, year one. Um, but the the idea was very cool, like how we can just have it like person detection, car detection and deployed in front of like shops, supermarkets and just have that for n not manually count what is the like monitor the, the, the camera data like 24 hours footage, but just have some AI and automatically like have some basic analytics what's happening outside. Yeah, you don't have to have somebody with a clicker <laughs> clicking every time a car drives by, which makes everyone's life a lot easier, I can imagine, and frees up some time from yeah. people. The, the other piece that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, was the whole like generative AI stuff you were doing before generative AI. But before we do that, did you come up with any cool techniques or ways to get these big computer vision models smaller? Were you pruning in those days? Were you distilling them? What was it looking like? I feel like that's one of the mm, one of the um, one of the challenges that right now still uh, people are facing because these all huge foundation models or transformers uh, like if we are able to deploy it on uh distill it and deploy it on small, like where the, there is no G, GPU stuff, there is no um, uh, computational resource available. So th that's the that's the solution there. So at that time, we were doing just a translation from um, Python to C++, which was very helpful. With that, we were able to distill it and we were able to uh, keep the accuracy and on the other note, keep the uh, the speed, like how many frames we can process per second, which is very important for JAWS where you just get a lot of data, a lot of video data and you need to process it. And you cannot just skip um, skip frames there. So this was the, the technique that we came up and it was good, like good enough for, for that use case. But ima I imagine that for a lot of use cases, especially like JAWS are being used in military or other like uh, verticals 
for sure there should be some other techniques to have better as accurate as possible, like close to 100%. Okay, 20 seconds before we jump back into the show. We've got a CFP out right now for the Data Engineering for AI and ML virtual conference that's coming up on September 12th. If you think you've got something interesting to say around any of these topics, we would love to hear from you. Hit that link in the description and fill out the CFP. Some interesting topics that you might want to touch on could be ingestion, storage, or analysis like data warehouse, reverse ETLs, DBT techniques, et cetera, et cetera. Data for inference or training, aka feature platforms, if you're using them, how you're using them, all that fun stuff. Data for ML observability and anything FinOps that has to do with the data platform. I love hearing about that. How you saving money, how you making money with your data. Let's get back into the show. So now tell me about this plastic surgery stuff that you were doing. <laughs> so I got that project uh, from doctors, like they were doing plastic surgery and their question was, their challenge was, hey, we are using Photoshop, very like classic, and we have a lot of data, like images of faces and we need to like set the landmarks, understand maybe uh, nose should be shaped this way, et cetera, like a lot of manual work and then back and forth with the, with the passion. So whether he or she likes the, the, the new shape or not. So this was the question and we were like, okay, how we can solve this. And we take, we took that, those all kind of like, they had a lot of data reference, like, um, reference images like pairs where they already manually did that and we trained a peak to peak model i remember it was like by tensorflow and it was arm based like generative adversarial network based solution and then after that doctors were able to upload their like images like the actual image uh, of patient and then get generated image with a new uh face like new nose or something else there should be it was a very fun project especially having those all like images like a lot of like these uh different faces different shapes and then trying to have these generative adversarial networks trained in a way to have better good results for for other like not the data not in the training site the, one of the first people that i talked to when diffusion models were getting really popular was a friend of mine who's a dentist and I was showing him some of the cool stuff you could do with at that time stable diffusion and he instantly was like huh I wonder if I could do this with people's teeth you know oh, I have okay. to constantly be thinking about how to better make the mouth and the teeth and the shapes yeah. of the teeth especially if he's doing work on them or he's putting in different new teeth and, and I was like, oh, I bet you could, but I think there's probably a better way to do it. Like I would be a little bit worried of <laughs> for a diffusion model yeah. to give someone a new teeth or a new tooth. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that, that's very funny. And also I feel like that's helpful for not technical, for doctors having that, like, yeah, some applications deployed on their computer just in case to have some reference before doing their manual work. For sure, they, yeah. they have to check it. You don't know what what kind of generated image could be there. For sure, there are false positives of post like this. We cannot guarantee hundred percent. But yeah, that was very uh, fun and also like good project. Yeah, it gives them a little inspiration. <laughs> so hopefully uh, that helps. Now, I for sure want to talk about like the idea of basically highly regulated industries and you it feels like you've worked in some different highly regulated industries like healthcare are there gotchas that you've seen that keep models or ai from making it to production one of the uh patterns that i can mention here is in these all verticals like from mm. agriculture, industry to healthcare surveillance. Now, like fintech, uh, we are involved in fi I'm involved in fintech now. But 
there is this like gap between domain experts, end users, and us, like as a builder. That was something that we always deal with. And now as well, like we always think about building something, but they're, the model actual users are people who who think that this is a magic, like, oh, we need to get this output or like doctors for plastic surgery purposes, we need to get this output. But like, there are a lot of cases where it's hard to communicate that output, why that that is happening and why you should expect that as well. Yeah. The, have you found any strategies on how to better communicate that? No. <laughs> I, 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 I cannot say I found, I remember when I, I was doing my PhD and one, like I had, I had my supervisor, but also I had a doctor professor supervisor. The first two months were horrible just to kind of have some language to talk about. I was saying something and she was like, she's an, ex she was, she is an expert. I mean, professor in, uh, cardiovascular field, but it was very hard to find this ground um, truth and talk to each other just to understand, even though we were solving the same problem. And so you think that's because you didn't have that shared vocabulary or was it just because the understanding or the expectations from yeah. the non-technical side were way out of scope of what is actually possible? I would say both, but the second one, later one, is um, it has more weight than the first one, like this all expectation and also like understanding of the of, um, expectations and understanding what's ha what's happening with AI. What is that? Like, what is the definition of AI? Yeah. Yeah. I feel strongly about this and I feel like these days, especially because there is so much noise, around AI, it's very hard to get non-technical stakeholders and even technical stakeholders. Like there's so many technical people that I've talked to who have played around with LLMs and they still think that it will do way more than it is actually capable of doing. And so yeah. being able to properly manage those expectations is an absolute art. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And, and I feel like that will help a lot in terms of product like any ai based product development and and ma making it to production that's the goal right we are not doing anymore well we are doing research but the goal is to have it in production exactly and so speaking of these almost like product metrics and jumping to that area, I think there is some fun stuff that we can look at when it comes to how you like to measure product metrics, how you like to think about evaluation metrics, almost like even we can go into monitoring and observability and what you've been seeing out there because I think you have a different viewpoint than most people that I've talked to where we know that evaluation is the hottest topic right yeah. now. We know that everyone is talking about evaluation, but it's almost like nobody has really cracked that nut and figured out the tried and true and tested way to evaluate output. So what's your take on this whole scenario? Oh, uh, this is one of my favorite topics in terms of evaluation, observability, monitoring, and then this like product analytics, diagnosis, understanding, like AI-based product, not classic web applications. So like in this topic, one of the examples that I try to bring, I try to bring as an analogy is that is this, whenever we build any web application and like just host it, what do we do? We use some analytics, right? We are not waiting for a couple of months and then turning on this Google Analytics or Amplitude after six months. No, whenever we host it, we just link it and then every day we check it, right? We check what's happening. They use this button, they don't use this. So my question is why we are not doing the same thing with AI-based solutions, right? We only care about evaluation, which is 
way important. That's important. It's not a, I'm not questioning that. Yeah, we should evaluate it. We should like calculate these all metrics like F1 score or like accuracy, recall, map, all these metrics, those are very important. But once it goes to production, we should have something like some data-driven way of understanding, well, how it is being used, what is, how end users are using it, what are their expectations, what they want actually from this product, and then catch it, like fetch it, and then like do this cycle again and again. Like, I feel like we are taking from model to user direction, but right now as we all are thinking about production LLM-based solutions, maybe we need to take the other direction, like backward from users to model. So this is something that I feel like we are missing in this LLM, like, well, AI evaluation, observability, monitoring observability, like chain. So how do you see that playing out in practice? Is it the conversations, like, so let's just take the quintessential rag chatbot. It is the conversations you're having with the chatbot, or is it beyond that? And I know that a lot of people will put the thumbs up, thumbs down, which is a pretty bad metric. Honestly, I think we've all recognized that doesn't really work because it's unclear if it's thumbs down. Is it, why is it thumbs down? And what does that actually mean? I am not the biggest fan of chatbots, but let's just like stick to that yeah, example. Yeah. How do you look at other metrics around it um, yeah. besides when somebody is getting very angry at the chatbot? Yeah, yeah. So basically we can say that there are two options here in terms of feedback, in terms of understanding how the chatbot is being used. One of the uh, options is explicit feedback, which is thumbs up, thumbs down, or a plain text about, well, I'm not happy with the output. This is wrong. I, I, I did a query to get consumer transactions in Q4 2022, but I'm getting business transactions. This is not correct. Imagine financial analysis using this chatbot. This is like explicit feedback, but what about all implicit like feedback that we can derive, we can get it and then derive signals. And we we saw that what I have seen based on my experience, just the usage of chatbot, like querying, qu querying something, paraphrasing it, leaving the chatbot or closing it and then opening it again. These all signals can make a difference in terms of understanding what is the issue? Maybe there is an issue in terms of knowledge hole in rack system, like context is not uh, informative enough to retrieve business transaction or uh, vice versa. Well, it, it also feels like, all right, maybe some kind of document is retrieved or you give a link to where you grabbed a snippet of that document and then that link is clicked upon and so these are all signals how do you make sense of which signals are good and which are bad because i'm i'm thinking about this and i'm like is that good if they click out of the chatbot does that mean that the answer they've gotten their answer or does that mean that they're frustrated and they don't want it anymore yeah that's a very that's one of the hardest problems like i frame it as a root cause analysis so root cause analysis in general it's a like term that we know, we have known for a while, like for decades, right? For traditional applications. And now root cause analysis for LLM-based solutions, LLM-based products. So in order to understand those signals, like negative, positive, neutral, just having these like logs, like queries, responses, and then some information about knowledge, like context, maybe retrieval, like system is available, like chain size, all these uh, things, how we can use all these like inputs and perform some root cause analysis and derive these all signals. And then based on those signals, maybe get some list of actions 
to automate this whole process. So it's basically trying to create metadata on all of the information that's going, like the chunk size or which chunks were fed into the LLM. Are you also looking at which embedding model was used to create the embeddings? Are you looking at at that far back? How do you? So far, no, we haven't done that that part yet, but we are, I, I, am, I, I, I bring this analogy like onion layers, like you can do this more and more, but it depends on the data that you have access to. If you have access to this, like only uh, the hyperparameters of retrieval system and, and a couple of other hyperparameters like temperature, yeah, you can do some analysis based on that and provide a list of actions um, about that hyperparameters as well. And when you have access to embedding model, yeah, you can do more and more, but it depends on what information you have access to. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And basically you're saying, all right, Let's get all the analytics on what the situation is instead of just the actual text that the user wrote back or the output text. It's like trying to capture every relevant piece of data so you can fully analyze the output or the experience that someone had with that chatbot as opposed to that one question, did it get answered? What would the correct answer be? versus what the output of the LLM is. You're like, how can we get a full picture of what's going on here? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, so what are other, so that's a chatbot. What are other ways that you've seen this happening? Yeah, like chatbots are one of the, one of the interfaces that right now LLM based solutions are are deployed, right? Other, um, besides chatbots, we have like agentic workflows or or like conversational AI, just a dashboard like uh, analytics uh, for intelligent document processing, where again, you, they can do some queries and based on that, those queries, they see some analytics. Or uh, yeah, agentic workflows are going to be the next like big thing. They are, they are being deployed in a lot of verticals and root cause analysis of agents, agentic workflows, uh, is very, ch- like it's more, more difficult than just root cause analysis of, of like crack or <laughs> prompt engineering. Yeah. Break that down for me. What are things that we need to be aware of as we're yeah. trying to root cause the agentic workflow? Oh, in order to root cause, uh, root cause this agentic workflow. Agentic workflow, like the the implementation is being done based on LLMs, RAG, like small different uh, like ways of implementation of LLMs, right? Prompt engineering, these all tasks. So now for agentic workflow, it's like orchestration of other root cause analysis, like root cause one, root cause two, and then orchestration of this. So that's why I'm saying it's more difficult than the, uh, the like classic, like rag, we can call it, but Mm -hmm. we should solve this to be able to solve the orchestrated problem. Yeah. So it's not only that, basically you're just going up in complexity, you're multiplying the complexity every time you add a new agent. And so what are some other ways that you are looking at the data to be able to root cause it? Like I I imagine you can get as creative as possible, but have you seen big levers that give you a much clearer picture? Hmm. Can you elaborate on the question a bit more? Yeah, so so I could see myself thinking, wow, if I can get all these different metrics, like 
the all the metadata around it and what Intention. browser the person is using or what all everything you you can get very granular with the data that you're trying to capture to give yourself that full story and that big picture but at the end of the day you may find that there are three or four metrics that give you 80 percent of that story yeah yeah that's a that's a really good question so we can say we can frame it what uh, what is that Ba what is that base combination that gives you that holistic view of your product, of your generative yeah. AI-based solution? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. I don't have an answer, but basically it's all about like peeling those all layers, identifying these all metrics, and then understanding like which metrics can be used as a can can present the other uh, like three uh, metrics over there like maybe you can yeah. use one and just have the picture of your product and how do we know like how, is there clear signals that you've seen where you're like oh when you find those metrics uh -huh. and it's probably different for every use case but when you do find those metrics you recognize them because they are so different or they are such an anomaly or is it like you're you're really like just going off of intuition and instinct uh you know what we did recently we introduced this impact score idea and this impact score is being calculated using different metrics the uh, different like several metrics, the results of several metrics. And with this, we can kind of have an average and we were able to kind of introduce one like um, metrics numbers so they can they can use that and they, they can try to make some decision based on that impact score. And right now we are iterating over that and trying to understand from fintech to legal AI how it is like it is different. Oh yeah. And the impact score, if I'm understanding that correctly, it's just the metrics, like how impact, how impactful this metric is to the greater picture or the, the big metric that you're trying to move the needle on. So like, how are these small metrics moving the bigger metric? So impact score, imagine like there are issues and this issue you can um you can uh present you can you can describe using a couple of metrics but which one has more weight in terms of in terms of analyzing it further so there is no one ground truth right which one we should take into account like for issue one uh, recall is X for issue to recall is Y and now how we can compare it. So we kind of map it to one uh, dimension and then we do comparison. So issues are being compared only using impact score. What is the impact score of this issue across different customers, across different models so how repeti repetitive is that issue oh so i think i'm seeing that you're saying you're saying like hey this metric may be very high for some use cases or some instances maybe not use cases it's more like the instance the interaction with yes. this end user this metric is off the charts but then on other instances this metric is pretty much non-existent so yeah. why is that? How impactful is this metric? Is it a little bit wonky? What does yeah. it really tell the story of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm seeing is that <laughs> we need data analysts for our <laughs> AI metrics and yeah. our AI usage metrics, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we see that it's not only about data analysts but also product managers these people are involved in the process like they are in charge of like 
in charge of product usage, right? The, it's their role, but also uh, it's not a classic like like they This is a bit new, like to understand these all metrics and underlying like root cause of those like numbers. Yeah, it's like you have to have a bit of the understanding of what a data analyst does or how a data analyst thinks. You have to be able to get intimate with that data, but it's not necessarily looking at how a user is interacting with a product, a traditional product, or how a how someone is buying something from an e-commerce store like it's not that type of data analyst or the the internal data that a company has and analyzing how to boost revenue or whatever it may be it's it's very much and i've heard this from i can't remember who right now my brain is failing me but they were saying how data scientists are very much in a great position because exactly what you're saying sounds a lot like what a data scientist could excel at. Yeah, yeah. So what also I I noticed with this um, AI like adaptation LLM, let's say, let's call it LLM, generative AI or whatever, is um, like eval tools, evaluation, like environment for developers, but these product managers are in between and they need something to know like about this products right hmm. well they cannot use product managers they can I, I don't think they can use eval eval tools like open source git clone these all things like but they need something like mix panel a bit more or google analytics a bit more with like more features like for data analysis so kind of we need a combination of of this all like existing things into one place so different stakeholders can can do their job. And now that is a really key point because you're talking about how the product manager needs to understand the value of the AI product and just using the evaluation tooling that is built for software engineers and machine learning engineers yeah. or AI engineers, that doesn't serve them very I don't. well. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it, that brings up another great point that, it, and it's almost like the same idea, but because now we have so many different personas that are able to use AI. <laughs> And the traditional tooling, like the infrastructure tooling and tooling in general, is built for engineers, kind of like I'm just making a broad sweeping general statement. The majority of the tooling is built for engineers. Yeah. You get the marketer who has been using low code, no code tools, and they've been able to create some kind of a use case that generates a lot of cash, but they have no way to track their prompts. Right. And and it's like they're not going to whip up weights and biases or ML flow. No, that's not built for them. And so there's these tools that will need to come onto the market that are specifically for the low code, no code users or the people that aren't interested in the software tooling side of things. But they still need to do their job with the AI products that are going out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on the other note, that tooling should be something because what we have seen, what I have seen with these product managers and everything, they are saying that we try to kind of communicate these all things to AI engineers, yes. like using Miro. We write down things and I'm like, how? Like, that's not a good workflow. How do they use it? Like, And they were like, we translate that's like product, let's say like financial analysis using, I'm a product manager, I'm dealing with that financial analyst at Bank of America. And my AI engineer doesn't want to work, like doesn't want to deal, like of course no. And then I need to <laughs> translate that to this AI engineer. I need to get that information 
to write down, structure it for AI engineer, maybe using Miro. I have heard that like they are using Miro. I'm like, how it's possible? Like you have a lot of tools. Like these people have a lot of eval tools, a lot of things. They also do you use also Jira? Like no, I sh there should be something like these old people can just log in and everyone will be happy, right? Well, even just thinking about if you are the product manager and you're doing what you were just talking about, let's gather as much data as possible and analyze this data so that we can get a full story on how effective our AI product is, right? Let's, mm -hmm. let's say that is an awesome way of deciding if an AI product is valuable or not. How do you put that into practice, right? Like, how, is the AI engineer, you're going to call up your data engineering friends. You're going to be like, okay, so now all of a sudden we've got a ton of data. We got to figure out where we're going to store it, how we're going to present it to our product managers, how we're going to do all of that. You now are going through that cycle and you're doing what you do with traditional products, but in a little bit wonky of a way, I would say. It's, it's yeah. almost like... And and it's so new that you're you're kind of searching in the dark and yeah. you're figuring things out as you go and you're recognizing, oh, do we also need that data? Maybe that could be good. Whatever. Let's throw Move it in up. there yeah. just in case. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Maybe we need that for the for the second iteration. And yeah. we have heard this as well. Like, you know, I was interviewing this small AI team. And they were they, they are delivering to uh, financial like institutions like finance, not technical people. And one of the I asked like, what is the challenge right now? Is it about drag? What is a what is it about? And he was like, it's a it's about under translating their like these end users um, experience in terms of product usage to like code requirement to feature requirement this like translation is like what kind of data we need how to process that data how to understand them and how incorporate that information to let's say rag implementation so like there is a kind of gap like right between these two people even though they have the same mission let's have an llm in production <laughs> That is 100% something that I can understand and vibe with. It's a, it's like there is a disconnect, but it's not a disconnect on purpose. It's just a disconnect in the way that things have shaped up. It's yeah. almost like we've ran really, really fast, fast. on the mm -hmm. engineering side, and we've been trying to keep up on all the other sides of the business. But... Since the exciting part is all the cool stuff you can do on the engineering side, that's where the energy has been going into. And that's what people have been focusing on. And so I see the, and now I understand completely what you're saying in terms of evaluation is something that we've been thinking of and we've been talking about, but we almost need to look at it from a different lens as opposed to only the engineers looking at evaluation metrics and evaluating the output, we need to bring in more stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because this is not a one side problem. We look at that, they, they say like, you are an engineer, you have to deliver 100% accurate chatbot. But I mean, it's not only my problem, right? There are a lot of people involved in this process and it's kind of something like they get this business problem. They try to kind of explain it to me as an engineer and then they are not happy with my work. But yeah. right, right. Like these people should take care of that as well. Like how can I do that alone? Right. And then have this back and forth. So like I have had that before this like generative AI. I, I remember when I was delivering that like on a culture um, that object detection uh, uh, model and everything, they were like, time to time, they were coming back, oh, it's not working well, um, the weather changed. I mean, now it's very rainy, this, and 
because of that, we d we didn't have much data. I didn't know that this this fall we will have a lot of rain. So this kind of like you know, but it, it should be something like everyone is aligned, some platform yeah. toolkit. So they see same is happening with LLM based solutions. It goes back to the big disconnect that you've seen with the subject matter experts mm -hmm. yeah. not being able to properly work with the engineers and map out all these different use cases or all these failure modes or the whole user journey, whatever it may be that you're trying to explain. You have so many different people that need to be involved. And we, as a community and as like just people working on LLMs have almost over optimized it feels like for the engineering side of the house and now we need to ha play catch up on all the other sides of the house and how can we get every stakeholder properly in the room having the conversation and making sure that the project is successful yeah yeah hard to it and compared to like if I compare my life, the problem that I was facing like six, seven years ago with this like object detection task. And now the difference is that right now with this generative AI LLM based solutions like chatbot, it is more user centric, like bunch of users are using it. But for like computer vision model, it was just like let's say five drones with this like um, spraying model to spray the, the field automatically. Yeah, that was a different like very like five complaint messages. Okay, we will do something. But uh, like hard, like dozens of like, I don't know, a lot of thousands of users are using it and then you're getting this all like you don't have any insights, you don't have any data-driven way to understand, and then there is this this connection, as you call it. This is fascinating to really harp on, and it's exciting to think about how much potential there is because of this, basically, this gaping hole in the way that we're doing things now, and almost like a, not a utopia, but just, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we also had... A, other people that could be dealing with this and helping us out and bringing yeah. their wisdom and expertise into the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something that should be solved by, it's a multi-angle problem. It's not only about the engineering, it's not only about product, it's not only about maybe customer success, but it's all about like these all, like aligning these all stakeholders into one place and and yeah i feel like with that we will have some some approach to solve the problem 100 percent. all right before we go i gotta know what's your deal with flamingos oh my God. <laughs> i didn't remember that oh i love them you you just saw that my hair is pink so i love them so much the design and everything we have it's all about pink and purple so it's just a love you cannot do anything with that. <laughs> well, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you coming on here and Thank you so speaking much. something that I have had a hard time articulating, but it, now that you say it, it's like, yeah, of course. And I l really like the fact that you've gone out there, you've been talking to a whole lot of users that are trying to capitalize on AI. They're, they've got AI in production and now... It's almost like the day two of, okay, so uh, usually with like uh, when we ship products, we have observability and like we want to know how it's doing, but we don't really have that clarity on it. And so coming on here, talking about these issues, and hopefully there are people out there yeah. that have been seeing this too, and they've been recognizing it. And uh, I would encourage anyone that is also on the same wavelength to reach out to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was awesome.